My brother and I would quickly like to thank our patrons for their continued support. If you'd like to support us, click the link in the pinned comment. On the 6th of May, 1937, the Hindenburg airship burst into flames as it was attempting to make its landing. Of the 97 people on board, 13 passengers, 22 aircrew, as well as one ground crew would die, consumed by the inferno that took less than a minute to consume the whole ship. What was seen as the height of luxury and human innovation was almost overnight abandoned. The public, haunted by the shocking footage of the fires consuming the airship with great speed and ferocity. In today's video, we will cover a brief history of airships, just what could have caused the Hindenburg disaster, and what it meant for the future of air travel. Airships are often referred to as Zeppelins, named after the German aviation innovator Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. Zeppelin would invent the rigid airship, which has an outer structural framework that maintains its shape. The lift is generated by large air cells, filled with either helium or hydrogen, gases that are both lighter than air. These air cells were initially made from the intestinal linings of cows. Around 100,000 cows were needed to build a standard Zeppelin. Other materials used for the gas cells would be rubberized cotton, which is far more cow friendly. As for the frame, it would be made from lightweight metals, such as aluminium. The German army made use of zeppelins during World War I, both carrying out bombing raids and as reconnaissance vehicles. Notably, airships were used to bomb the likes of Paris and London, bringing the first taste of total war to civilian populations well behind the front lines. But the true value of the airships would come in their use as civilian transports, Airship travel became a symbol of status and of the technological marvel of the post-war world. Transatlantic flights via airship were twice as fast as the quickest cruise liners, yet offered the same luxury. The Hindenburg airship was designed to have a duralumin structure with 16 cotton gas cells of helium. The airship's outer skin was treated cotton to protect the gas cells from ultraviolet light and infrared radiation, as these could cause damage to its integrity. Whilst it was initially planned that helium would be used, it was switched to hydrogen. The only countries holding supplies of helium at the time were the United States and the Soviet Union, who were not prepared to sell the gas. Helium is not as light as hydrogen, but has one major upside. Helium is not flammable, whilst hydrogen is incredibly flammable. The smallest spark catching the smallest of leaks can be catastrophic. And whilst German airships had a stellar safety record, this was not the case for other countries. On the 5th of October 1930, the British airship R101 crashed during its maiden voyage, bursting into flames and killing 48 of the 54 people on board. This disaster highlighted the dangers of hydrogen airships, but did little to dissuade the construction of the Hindenburg. Without any other alternative gas, hydrogen was used for the Hindenburg. In March of 1936, the Hindenburg took its maiden flight. The space for the passengers was divided between two decks, A and B. The Hindenburg's air deck contained the airship's lounge, dining room, port and starboard promenades as public spaces. 25 double berth cabins were modern but small, with passengers expecting to spend the most of their time enjoying the public spaces. The lounge was lavishly decorated, fitted with lightweight furniture and even a specially made lightweight grand piano. The dining room offered views of the port side airship, complete with rich red upholstery and silk wallpaper. The B deck on the Hindenburg was located directly below A deck and contained the passenger's bar, the kitchen, passenger toilets and shower facilities, along with the crew and officers' halls. Most surprising of all, B deck contained a smoking room. It was however pressurised to avoid any dangers of hydrogen leaks and only one electric lighter was available, controlled by the crew who would make sure no one left the area with a lit cigarette or pipe. As a quick aside to the politics of the time, the Hindenburg had been named after Field Marshal and President Paul von Hindenburg. 
Chairman of the Zeppelin Company, Dr. Hugo Eckener, had put his name forward as a presidential candidate in 1932. He was seen as a unity candidate to stop the rise of Adolf Hitler, who sought to claim presidency. However, Eckener stepped aside when Hindenburg ran for his second term. Hindenburg went on to defeat Adolf Hitler in the presidential election. But this was not the end of Hitler's rise to power, and once in command of Germany, Eckener was targeted by the Nazis. Eckener was a strong opponent of Nazism, and only avoided arrest through Hindenburg's intervention. Eckener would eventually be sidelined within his company, whilst his name was blacklisted, forbidden from appearing in printed media or in films about his airships. Meanwhile, the Zeppelins and airships would be used by the Nazi propaganda ministry, emblazoned with swastikas and sent overseas as a method of spreading Nazi Germany's image on the world stage. Between its maiden voyage in 1936 until 1937, the Hindenburg was able to make 17 successful crossings of the Atlantic, usually flying to the United States or to Brazil. Its last journey was to take the Hindenburg to Lakehurst in New Jersey. The plan was for the Hindenburg to fly between Lakehurst and Newark before returning to Europe, fully booked and carrying passengers who wished to attend the coronation of King George VI. As the Hindenburg made its final crossing of the Atlantic, the journey was unremarkable. Passenger capacity was relatively low, with just 36 passengers and a large crew of 61. Due to strong headwinds, the airship was slightly delayed by the time it reached the American coast. The Hindenburg flew over Boston and New York City, causing those below to look up in awe. The airship flew south from New York and arrived at its destination, the Naval Air Station in Lakehurst, New Jersey at around 4.15pm. But thunderstorms in the area concerned the Hindenburg's captain Max Pross and Lakehurst Station commanding officer Charles Rosendahl. Both agreed on delaying the landing until conditions improved, with the Hindenburg being taken over the New Jersey coast to wait out the storms. By around 6pm, with the weather conditions having improved, Pruss was contacted and advised to return and begin landing the Hindenburg. At around 7pm, the Hindenburg was making its approach to the mooring station, coming from the southwest direction, at around 600 feet in the air. As there was still a relatively strong wind coming from the east, Captain Pruss initiated a wide left turn, flying in an oval whilst descending in order to land into the wind. Whilst descending, hydrogen was vented to reduce buoyancy, but it was noted that the tail of the airship was dipping more than expected. Attempts were made to vent more hydrogen from the gas cells towards the front of the airship as to level out the Hindenburg. In addition, the water ballasts were vented and six crew members were sent to the bow of the ship, but still the Hindenburg would not level. Whilst these attempts were made, the wind shifted direction from the east to the southwest. As the airship was closing in on the landing zone and with the need to land into the wind, Captain Bross ordered a sharp S-turn to change the direction of the Hindenburg's landing. By around 7.20pm, the mooring lines were dropped, with the Hindenburg just 180 feet above the ground. But, the ground crews noticed that something was amiss. It appeared that there was a wave-like fluttering of the outer cover around where the gas cell number 5 was located, towards the rear of the airship. Some on the ground had noted that the Hindenburg was coming in faster than they had previously seen. By around 7.25pm, flames were seen erupting from the rear of the ship, between gas cells 4 and 5. Helsman Helmut Lau, who was stationed at the auxiliary control stand in the lower fin, described the following. The bright reflection in the cell was inside. I saw it through the cell. It was at first red and yellow and there was smoke in it. The cell did not burst on the lower side. The cell suddenly disappeared by the heat. The fire proceeded further down and then it got air. The flame became very bright and the fire rose up to the side, more to the starboard side as I remember seeing it, and I saw that with the flame, aluminium parts and fabric parts were thrown up. In that same moment, the forward cell and the back cell of cell 4 also caught fire. At that time, parts of girders, molten aluminium and fabric parts started to tumble down from the top. The whole thing only lasted a fraction of a second. The fire took hold and engulfed the tail of the ship, causing the nose of the airship to point skyward. Soon there followed a gout of flame erupting from the bow. 
Within a few seconds, the entire ship was consumed by the flames, meaning for the crew and passengers on board, survival depended on where one was stationed. Many of the passengers were watching the descent from the promenades close to the windows. Whilst some were thrown about by the sudden descent, many were able to make their way out of the windows, clambering over the red-hot metal and falling onto the muddy field below. Those passengers who attempted to retrieve items from the cabin or went to look for family members deeper within would meet their end in the inferno. Some became trapped, unable to open the sliding doors and escape to safety as the mechanisms jammed. As for the crew, placement again played a huge part as to whether they would survive. Of those 12 crew members at the front of the airship, only three managed to survive the gout of flame that erupted out of the nose of the airship. Meanwhile, 10 of the 12 crew in the control car managed to escape death, being able to clamber out. If one was towards the periphery of the Hindenburg and able to jump to safety, chances are you would survive. Whilst many made their escape from the burning wreck, Chief Petty Officer Frederick Tobin, the enlisted airship pilot in charge of the Navy landing party, rallied his sailors by shouting, Navy men, stand fast. Tobin had been a survivor of an airship crash, and he prepared to put his life on the line to help those still in danger. The men under his command followed suit, with their bravery seen in the footage of the disaster as they ran towards the flames. In the end, 13 passengers, 22 aircrew and one ground crew member were dead. Whilst many other of the airship crashes occurred at sea, away from the public, the Hindenburg's crash was captured on film. Awaiting journalists and civilians managed to capture the horror and the heroism on display as the Hindenburg went up in flames. The famous footage, overlaid with the words of Herb Morrison, have become an iconic refrain in the face of disasters. Whether or not it was one airship crash too many, or that the footage was far too shocking, the Hindenburg crash spelled the end of airship travel. Aeroplanes were starting to become more available. After all, American Airlines had contracted the Hindenburg to shuttle their passengers from Laker to Newark for connections to airplane flights. No longer seen as the luxurious method of transportation, airship construction and flights wound down, replaced by aeroplanes. As for the cause of the disaster, there are a number of theories. The key question is, why was there a hydrogen leak, as without the leak, there would not have been the disaster as we know it. One common theory is that the sharp S-10 employed during the landing was the final stress needed to cause the steel wire to snap and cut into the gas cell. Such steel wires ran throughout the length of the Hindenburg and would have been exposed to the elements namely the salt and moisture during the Atlantic crossings. Combined with the repeated strain through the usual movement, the wires may have been snapped, piercing the gas cells. All that was needed was the spark to ignite the dangerous combination of hydrogen mixing with the air. Due to the thunderstorms in the area, there would have been a high electric charge present on the day. As the Hindenburg flew through the sky, it would have gained a positive charge. When the landing lines dropped and touched the ground, the Hindenburg would have received a negative charge. This would mean there was a strong chance a spark could occur, especially when considering the huge metalwork of the airship's frame. The Hindenburg disaster is seen as the nail in the coffin of the Zeppelin age. In reality, it was only a matter of time for the already more efficient aeroplanes to replace them. What the disaster did highlight to the world was the dangers of such hydrogen airships, as until then, the wider public had never seen such an example of a disaster so vividly available on film, and confidence disappeared in the airships. Today, airships, blimps and zeppelins all use helium and tend to be much smaller, mainly used for advertising such as the famous Goodyear blimp. But for those consumed in the fire of the Hindenburg disaster, it is of little consolation as to the far safer methods of air travel we now enjoy. Few images have the power of the Hindenburg disaster, made all the more disturbing by knowing the fate of those aboard. Oh